From direct fusion drives to unconventional aero spikes, we take a look at some of the most amazing rocket engines. It is very difficult to build a completely reusable low cost engine. Furthermore, it's even more difficult to build an electric pump fed engine in which the fuel pumps are electrically powered, typically through batteries. That is why the Rutherford is a game changer because it is the first electrically pump fed rocket to reach orbit in the Electron. The assumption of powering a rocket engine through batteries is a little bit crazy to say the least. And the current energy density of lithium polymer batteries barely makes this feasible. But this also translates into a very simplistic engine design with added controllability. If that is not enough, the Rutherford is mostly 3D printed via electron beam melting, meaning its engine chamber, injector, turbo pumps, and main propellant valves are all 3D printed. Nine Rutherfords are utilized in the first stage of the Electron, with peak thrust around 56,000 pounds of force. This leads into a secondary stage, which is propelled by one Rutherford engine, meaning the rocket can launch around 600 pounds into low Earth orbit. Moving on, we get to the Mark II rocket engine. We are living in a very interesting time because there are many companies coming out with supersonic and even hypersonic aircraft. This particular Mark II from Dawn Aerospace combines peroxide along with kerosene to obtain high specific impulse. The engine is capable of multiple restarts with a maximum 20 cycles without degradation. The end goal of this engine is to provide a maximum speed of Mach 3 at an altitude of 60 miles. And the main advantage here is that this rocket engine can obtain very high altitudes. Eventually this will lead to the Mark III which is quite a bit bigger and it will be able to launch an orbital rocket. Rockets typically use a bell-shaped nozzle where gases in the combustion chamber converge towards the throat at high pressure and temperature. However, this process is difficult to master because the ambient pressure changes as you reach higher altitudes. Increases in velocity also result in decreases in pressure. So the geometry of the nozzle is very important because it determines the expansion process of exiting gases. The aerospike is a very unique design, which I will cover more in a future video because in theory it is one of the most efficient designs for rockets. It drops the udder bell and instead has a plug in the middle, thus regulating the expansion of gases. This increases efficiency because it can compensate for altitude change by altering its exhaust shape. However, designing this type of engine is difficult because there are additional cooling weight and structural problems associated with the aero spike. Pangea Aerospace claims to have solved this issue with their 300 kN Demo P1. It will also be able to be reused, but it's still at a demo stage, so only time will tell if this can be a fully reusable rocket engine. But it is worth noting additive manufacturing has completely changed the game. And these new AM techniques can finally make the classic aero spike engine a reality. At number four, the Raptor 2. The original Raptor from SpaceX was nothing really new, and it was basically an old design with hefty complexities. The new Raptor 2 is pretty impressive. It's still a methane liquid engine, but it has a more efficient design, which has been simplified. The combustion chamber, nozzle, and electronics have all been reworked through welding components together. All this simplicity allows it to be relaunched in a few hours compared to the Raptor 1, which required multiple weeks for reusability. The Raptor 2 can also produce around 250 metric tons of thrust, so the engine burns hot to add a greater amount of pressure. Once again, when you push the envelope, there will be technical problems associated with these types of engines, but it's going to be really interesting to see how SpaceX will solve the thermal outputs of the Raptor. Eventually, all these Raptor 2s will be put together in the Starship, and this will be able to launch 100 tons into orbit. We get to number 3 and it's the Sabre by Reaction Engines. Once again, I am going to cover some of the more ambitious projects, and this particular one is a synergetic air breathing rocket engine. This fully reusable hybrid can go up to Mach 5 via air breathing mode. 
and then up to Mach 25 via rocket for orbit. As stated before, Mach 3 to 5 is very tricky because it's an in-between phase for turbo or ramjets. So reaction engines developed a precooler which cools air dramatically by 1000 degrees in a fraction of a second. This groundbreaking precooler has already been tested, so it's a very important development not just for Sabre but maybe for other hypersonic vehicles as well. The Sabre is still quite a few years away from completion, but once completed, it will be one of the most revolutionary engines ever developed. The other long-term project which I have also mentioned is the Vazmir. Electric plasma rockets will likely be the future engine of space. They don't have very high thrust ratios, so they can't get you off Earth, but they have an effective high specific impulse. So they can produce thrust for a very long time and obtain very high speeds. The Vazmir is a very impressive variant. With a power density of 6 megawatts per meter squared, it's exponentially more powerful than a typical hull thruster or a gridded ion engine. The Vazmir is actually pretty simplistic, and it's split into three phases. Gas is injected and heated via RF to produce plasma. The plasma is then energized even more with RF in the second stage, and then eventually converted to a high velocity exhaust through a magnetic nozzle. The brilliant thing about the Vazmir is that it can be completely scalable from a few kilowatts to multi megawatts. You might have also heard about the story of this particular engine being used to get to Mars in 39 days. And realistically, that is probably not sustainable because you'd need a very large variant. But ultimately, the Vazmir is capable of producing over 100,000 miles per hour. So it will definitely be a critical attribute in future spacecraft. At number one, the direct fusion drive. One of the most advanced engines being developed is a nuclear fusion rocket, which can provide both thrust and electric power to the craft. The concept is based on field reverse configuration, which can transfer electricity straight from the reaction. So there are no steam generators or anything like that. This is also being researched by TAE and Helion for power generation. In a DFD, propellant is ionized once it enters a strong magnetic field. The propellant flows around the core and then is heated by the fusion process. The propellant expands into a magnetic nozzle, thus producing thrust. The DFD could theoretically produce 10 newtons of thrust per megawatt of fusion power. So ultimately, it could obtain 100,000 miles per hour in space. Princeton is currently developing a direct drive, which will roughly be the size of a car, or 1,000 times smaller than ITER. And this particular variant is being designed for a 10 megawatt output. Ultimately, reversed field configuration is a very important development not just for power generation, but maybe for space travel as well. More importantly, I would like to know what you think about all these different types of engines. So please leave a comment, like the video if you enjoyed it, and also make sure to subscribe to my channel.